is this is the second most known story in Daniel. You know, the first one would probably be Daniel in the lion den, right? And this is Rack Shack and Benny in the firefighter. The men who took a stand against Nebuchadnezzar and his idol, his image, and God came through. It's powerful. You know, Nebuchadnezzar already knows that God is God. And we saw that in chapter 2, after uh, Daniel got the interpretation for the dream. Chapter 247, it says, The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. He knows who God is, yet he's not serving God. Do you know that that's kind of the progression? You know, you start off in Sunday school or somebody tells you about God and you hear the stories. And eventually there comes a point where you find out that God is really real. He'll intervene in our life, deliver us, do something. We'll sense his presence and we'll realize God is really real. But that does not mean that we suddenly start serving God and giving our life to him. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, it gives one of the reasons why Christ died. It said, and he died so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us, gave his life for us. So that is one of the main reasons why Christ came and why he even died, was so that we would be able to give our lives to him. And really, that's the beginning of the real Christian life, and that's the beginning of the real walk with God is when we give up our old life to have his life. And so if we haven't done that yet, we're not even, we're probably not even really Christians. You know, that's really the dividing line. It's not what you say you believe. It's not where, what church you belong to or how you were baptized. It's who is the Lord of your life? You know, people talk about that. They say Jesus is Lord. You know what Lord means? Lord is the one who tells people people what to do and the subjects do it so Lord means they're in charge so this is what's happened here Nebuchadnezzar knows for sure that God is God he saw him intervene in a powerful way but we're talking about maybe it could be 15 years later chapter 3 Daniel and his friends could be getting close to 30 years old remember that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had disturbed Nebuchadnezzar so much that he couldn't sleep but that dream was about a statue and that statue had a head of gold. And when Daniel interpreted that dream, he said, you, O king, are that head of gold. He said, you are the king of kings and God is giving you rule over the whole earth. And he's even putting the animals subject under you. So he was letting Nebuchadnezzar know that he was there because God had put him there. When he said, you are the head of gold, I can just see Nebuchadnezzar getting all kind of happy about that, you know? I'm the head of gold, you're the king of kings, and God's giving you all this rule and dominion. Even the animals are subject to you. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was, was the ruler of the whole world. When he uh, fought that battle at Karshemesh and beat the Syrians and the Egyptians, there was nobody else in the whole world who could stand against his power. This man was the greatest king of all time. He must have been a little surprised when Daniel continued with the interpretation and said that the, the arms of silver represent another empire that's going to come after yours. An empire that's not going to be as great as yours, an inferior empire. The Medo-Persian empire that came after that was actually bigger. They controlled more area on the planet than Babylon did. But God called that an inferior empire because and we're going to see this a little later on with Daniel in the lion's den. That king didn't have ultimate power. Nebuchadnezzar had ultimate power. He could do whatever he wanted. But do you remember when Darius had to throw Daniel in the lion's den? Because he made a law that no one could pray to anyone but to him. The guys who talked him into making that law knew Daniel was going to pray. And it said he prayed just like he always did. He went up to his room and he started praying and they arrested him. They threw him in the lion's den. And Darius was like, man, he was sorry. He stayed up all night. He refused his food and his entertainment. He stayed up all night hoping that Daniel would be okay. And the first thing in the morning, he went to the lion's den and said, oh, Daniel, did your God save you? And he did. Darius couldn't override the law of the land. 
Darius wasn't an ultimate powerful king like Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar could do whatever he wanted. Darius was under the rule of the land, so his empire, his kingship wasn't as strong as Nebuchadnezzar. This guy was the most powerful man on the whole planet. And what he said went. He knows who God is, but his pride is keeping him from giving his life and yielding his life to serve God and to surrender his life to God. He still has his plans, his will, his desires. So then Daniel tells him the next empire that's coming and the next empire is coming. So don't you know that Nebuchadnezzar was sitting there thinking, when's his next empire coming? When am I gonna be challenged in my rule? I'm the head of gold. So what we see here is he starts building a, a statue for himself. It says 60 cubits in some Bible. That's 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. It's kind of a skinny looking tall statue. But that's 90 feet tall golden statue that he sets up on a plane. So he's, he wants to be the whole statue. The head was gold, right? He wants to be the whole statue. He wants to have the whole thing. And then he gets every leader in the world that's under him to come there for the dedication. And he tells him, now when you hear the music, you bow down to this statue and worship. He's making sure that he doesn't have somebody in his empire who's getting ready to set up the next empire, take him over. He wants to make sure everybody gives allegiance to him and he is the top dog. He is the one in charge. And we're also gonna see that he doesn't even, his, he doesn't really even believe in his gods. He is the one that's on top. He is the God as far as he's concerned because we're gonna see, he's gonna ask these guys that won't bow down, who's gonna save you? What God is gonna save you from my hand before I throw you in that furnace? What God? So he's saying, nobody can save you from me. He's saying he's even above his gods. That's what he's saying. Nebuchadnezzar is serving himself. So even though he knows God is God, he is sure last week he announced that no other God could do what Daniel's God did. And he knows God is God for sure. He's had that revelation. He's still on the throne of his life and on the throne of his kingdom. And we're gonna see how this plays out. We're just gonna go ahead and read from chapter three, one right through verse 18. So Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods 
or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage of fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke and saying to him, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. These three guys are the only three guys other than Daniel who took a stand at the beginning of the book to stand up for their religious beliefs. They were the ones that said, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's food. They're given the meal card, they get to eat at the king's table, but that's going to be different than the food that they're told to eat by the Bible. The Jews had food they could eat and food they couldn't eat. God told them. So God wants to be intimately involved with everything in our life right down to even what we eat. Isn't that interesting? But they took a stand and drew a line right there. And they only ate vegetables and water for three years. And when they came before the king, they were found better, smarter, wiser. Daniel had the ability to interpret dreams than all the other 10,000 people that came with him from Israel. God gave them supernatural wisdom and abilities because they were willing to take a stand for God. Seems silly like just what you eat. But God didn't think that was silly. God says in his word that if you're faithful in the little things, he will put you over bigger things. God is more concerned with our character than he is with what we say to people, what our jobs are, what we look like, what kind of authority it seems like we have. He's more concerned with our character than he is with all that other stuff. And our character is demonstrated by how we handle the little things. So Nebuchadnezzar, when they brought him before, realized these guys were smarter and more talented than all these other people. And you see that at the very end of chapter 2, you know, 47, he says that he knows truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since he could reveal the secrets. So he knew, he already had this revelation. And then he promoted Daniel and gave him many gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel also petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the king's gate. So these guys were in charge of all the affairs over Babylon. And when it said these Chaldeans came, and told the king, hey, oh king, there's these guys who don't bow down to you, who don't do what you're telling them to do, and they're not afraid of your gods, they don't worship your gods, and they don't bow this image. They were jealous that these guys got bumped in promotion over them. These are the guys that should have been, you know, in their positions, but Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were put in front of them because God gave them favor. They were there because God put them there. And look, when he set up this gold image, He's trying to get everybody in his realm. Every, he has every one of his high officials from all the different countries he's conquered, all the leaders, all the, set, all the rat traps. Is that what it said? But sat traps, what's a sat trap? They were, <laughs> they were keepers of the realm. And so they were over the taxes, over the army, over the things. But he had, okay, so you had the, the keepers of the realm, you had the governors, you had the judges, you had the counselors. You had the magistrates, all the government officials from every country in the world that they dominated were all there. 
And can you imagine when he set this up, this multimedia event, you know, with music and, and it's, this is like when the president is inaugurated. You have all these people from all over the world and this guy announces, now when you hear this music, everybody fall down and worship this idol. And when that, when it went off, there's 10,000 people from Israel, just one country they conquered. They conquered the whole known world, everywhere from Africa to India. And these leaders and all these people are all there in this plain of Dura. And when that music started, they all fell down. All the big shots, all the leaders, all the cool people bowed down to this image and worship. They just figured that's just what they're supposed to do. That's what the king said. And three guys are standing there and they don't bow down. You know how hard that would be? When all the world is doing something different and you decide you're not going to bow down to this image, they are committed to serving God. And they've, they've seen God come through. They've seen God, you know, give Daniel the interpretation of the dream. They've seen, they've been lifted up. But what's the very first commandment? God's top 10, 10 commandments. What's the very first commandment? Number one, we just begun. God should be first in your life. They knew they were supposed to serve God and him alone. And they took their stand again on biblical principles. They didn't just decide they're not going to do what the king told them to do. They've been doing everything right up to this point. They've been serving the king, doing what's right. That's why the king, when he hears about it, he's like, what? He goes, you know, he doesn't just go out and have him killed, thrown in the furnace. He does something wise. He has them come before him and he asks them himself, is it true? Is it true? Then he says, I'm going to give you another chance. <laughs> now, if you're ready, verse 15, when you hear the sound and they go through the whole list of instruments and you hear the music, if you fall down and worship the image, which I have made good, if you don't, you're going to be cast immediately into this flaming furnace. The king wanted to know for sure here from their mouths and they are willing to stand against all the customs, all the people, all the leaders stand alone and face Nebuchadnezzar. They say, they say, our God is the, able to deliver us. Nebuchadnezzar is what God can deliver you. He says, our, they say, our God can deliver us. But even if he don't, we are not bowing down to worship your idol. How can he know for sure that God is God and still not surrender his life to him? Why does that happen? Do you think there's anybody that you know that may know for sure that God is God, but they haven't surrendered their life? Do you think that's possible? There's people like that all around us. There's people where God has intervened in their lives. God has delivered them. God has done all these things, and yet they're still living for themselves. And that is one of the things when we see in Revelation, when the wrath of God is poured out on the earth, it's going to be poured out on people who don't obey the gospel and who live for themselves. All of us deserve the wrath of God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, the Lord who gave his life, put on an earth suit and came and gave his life so that he could save us from that wrath. But if we decide we don't want to go by that plan and we still want to do what we want to do when we want to do it and how we want to do it, then fine, we're allowed to do that, but we will pay the consequences. The very thing that he died to save us from will be what will suck us up and that will be the destiny of our life. We have to decide who we're going to serve. Daniel and his friends remembered who they were. Talk about the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. It talks about the seed of the word of God is sown on the shallow earth where there's rocks beneath the surface and how it springs up quickly. But when the heat of the day comes, it withers because the roots aren't deep. You know, you can hear the word of God and you can say, that sounds great. And you can jump on board and you can say, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to do this and I'm going to go for it. But as soon as the persecution starts coming, as soon as things don't look the way you think they should, as soon as you say, oh, look, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to, and now look what God did, and we fall away because our roots aren't deep, that's where the rubber hits the road. Daniel and his friends were yanked out of their house, made to walk 900 miles, probably in chains, probably castrated, sent to school, 
to learn a new language, separated from their family, separated from everything they are, given a new name where the world was trying to press its identity onto them. And yet they could stand for that God who didn't seem like he was doing anything for them at that point. Do you realize that's the kind of commitment God's looking for? In persecution, in this fiery furnace, that's where God is going to manifest his glory. That's where he is going to reveal himself. You know, they may have been thrown in that furnace, but when Nebuchadnezzar looks in there in a little bit, he's going to be like, did we throw three guys in there? Oh yes, King. Well, there's a fourth one in there. He looks like the son of God. And they're all in there walking around. God is manifesting his power and his glory in the midst of the furnace. If those guys would have chickened out and lost their faith before they went in the furnace, they would have fried. But they were like, even if he doesn't save us, we're not bowing down. We're trusting God regardless of what it looks like. He lets us go through fire. He lets us go through water, through circumstances. But he promises to deliver us through it. You know, we want God to deliver us out of problems. But sometimes it's a greater witness to people around us to see that God goes through the problem and brings us through the other side. These fellows might have actually been thinking of this scripture from Isaiah 43. 1 through 3. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When, not if, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Listen to this one. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place, since you were precious in my sight. See, we can think God has abandoned us because here we are getting ready to fall in the fire, or here comes a flood of circumstances overwhelming us. But the truth of the matter, you're precious in God's sight. He was willing to give his life for you. Like if you were the only one on earth God would put on his earth suit and come down here and give his life for you. Isn't that amazing to think about? That that is really the depth of his love for us. He says we're precious in his sight and he wants to redeem us. But he doesn't say, I'm gonna keep you out of the flood. He said, when the waters come. He didn't say, I'm gonna keep you out of the fire. He goes, when you walk through the fire, he promises to be with us. God wants us to carry his image. Do you remember when the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus about paying taxes? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because if he says it's right to pay taxes to Caesar, then all the Jews will get mad at him. But if he says it's not right to pay taxes to Caesar, then they're going to turn him into the Romans and say this guy's trying to lead an insurrection, tell people not to pay their taxes. So what does Jesus do? He said, give me a coin. And they hand him a coin. And he says, whose image is on this coin? Remember, this is a key thing about image. Whose image do we bear? Whose image is on this coin? They said Caesar's. He goes, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In other words, he's on the coin. You pay him your taxes. You do what you're supposed to do for him. But give to God what belongs to God. If we carry God's image, we give our life to God. He's going to preserve us, protect us. But whose image do we bear? See, they didn't conform to the image of the world. Now they have all this, the, all the leaders of the world, and they all want to bow down to this image. Do you know that the world today is trying to press us into a mold? It has an image of how the man is supposed to look, how a woman is supposed to look, how success is supposed to look all these images that the world is projecting through media and through through the uh the news and the politics this is what it looks like to be a successful leader this is what it looks like to be a a beautiful woman this is are we going to be pressed into that mold and that image or are we going to go by this when when we read in the bible that for a woman not to just be adorned outwardly with hair and clothes and jewelry, but the quiet, the inward part of the heart where the true beauty is, or man to be in subject to God and to his family. Do you know, is that what we go by or do we go by what the world says? That is the same decision we have to make as these guys had to make.
The world is trying to conform us into its image and we have to decide whose image will we bear. Are we going to carry the image of the world or are we going to do like Romans 8 29 says, be conformed to the image of Christ. You know, a lot of people know Romans 8 28, where all things work together for good for those that love God according to his purpose. But then the next verse says, for who he knew, he preordained to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is the image that we are to bear. And if we do, if we choose to do that, we will come into persecution. But the great thing about persecution is persecution opens the door for witness. Through that very persecution where he's threatening to throw them in the fire, that's the very thing where God has revealed not only to Nebuchadnezzar to take him to the next level, because Nebuchadnezzar is like, what God is going to save you out of my hand? That's pretty arrogant. He's not even saying his gods can do it. He's saying, I am the top dog and I want you to worship this statue that represents me and my kingdom and give your allegiance to that. I want to make sure that nobody's here that's going to try to put in that next empire. You're all serving me. You're all bound to me. And if you don't, what God is going to take you out? He's going to protect you and, and keep you from my hand. He's saying, I'm the top dog. God is going to intervene and show him, hey, there's somebody so much bigger than you, you can't even imagine. That's going to be the next step. But Nebuchadnezzar still ain't going to serve God. He's going to realize that. He's going to make a decree, but he's still not going to surrender his life. What does it take for us to surrender our life to God? Isn't that crazy how we can know who God is, understand who God is, and we still want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it? Human nature. You know, being involved in a program like this, a lot of us realize that it takes God to break us. It takes us to get to the end of ourselves. It takes us to get to the dead end where we realize that what we're doing and how we were living isn't going to make it. And we have to yield our lives to him. And once we do that, we get to first base. But you know what we have to do is continue to live like that. We can't forget where we came from. Nebuchadnezzar realized God was God, but he forgot. And now he's trying to establish his own kingdom. And he's trying to press everybody else into that mold. And God is saying, I have a mold I want to press everybody into. It's my image. And it deals, it deals with laying down your life. As these guys are willing to lay down their life and go into the fire, he's revealed again. His power, not just to Nebuchadnezzar, but to every leader of the known world at that time. They're all there. Warren Wiersbe, he wrote a, a verse by verse commentary of the Bible. But this is interesting what he said in this one place. As we move towards the end of the age, the furnace of opposition will be heated seven times hotter and the pressure to conform will become stronger and stronger. It will take a great deal of grace, prayer, courage, and faith for God's people to stand tall for Christ while others are bowing their knees to the gods of this world. What if today, you walked out of here, you were given the ultimatum, renounce Christ or die. One time we were in Uganda, Idi Amin's empire was rising. Idi Amin was a, a dictator and he was a very uh, cruel man and he was killing thousands of people, just slaughtering them and they were laying dead in the streets. People would rush by and they'd see somebody laying dead in the street or floating in a pond and they'd rush over there to see if there was somebody they'd know and then they'd hurry on to where they were going so they wouldn't be the next person. These guys were waiting in a church on God and they, and they were believing it would be better to die in church than to die at the hand of these soldiers that were going through their villages and killing everybody. So they were praying and seeking God and pressing through and a lot of them came to, the, to really deep faith during that time because it was real. You know, they had to depend on God to live this little church in this area we were in these soldiers come in the door bust in the door and they say all right he goes who's willing to die for christ he said if you're not willing to die for jesus you better get out right now because we're going to kill everybody in this church and most of the people got up and left and then they locked the doors and they said we're believers too <laughs> we came to worship with you and then they worship they sang they prayed, they had a great worship service, but everybody, they wanted everybody out 
who didn't believe because they don't want them telling because they had spies in the churches and they had people, you know, working for the government. And if you weren't willing to die for it, then they figured that you weren't real Christian. And that's kind of how it works. That's what we were saying the other day. If you're not willing to die for what you believe, then, then is that really worth living for? That's a good question. How do we respond to the experiences and events when things go bad, suffering and pain? You know, I can't tell you how many people come, in, come through programs like this or just through churches and they get fired up. God touches their life, does something, they start seeking God and then something turns out different than what they, they expected. Do you notice that these guys, when they're getting thrown into the fiery furnace, they don't say, they don't stand up there and declare, God's going to save us and you can throw us in there and, and we believe and we trust and we believe because, you know what, their faith wasn't in the outcome. Their faith was in God. They were willing to yield their lives to the purposes of God and trust God regardless of what it looked like. So instead of saying, God abandoned me, God caused me to be thrown in the furnace and and I'm giving up on God. They're like, hey, even if he don't save us, we're not bowing down. That was the attitude where God came and intervened and walked in the furnace with them. You know, God's not our bellboy. He doesn't just do whatever we ask him to do. We can't just say something over and over enough to make God do something. But we can yield to God and trust him. And who's the greatest example of that? Jesus is facing the cross. He's facing the suffering. He's facing all the sin of the world being put on him. He's in the garden. And he's praying and, and drops of, of, uh, of sweat are coming down like great drops of blood off him. He's in such anguish and torment. And he don't say, God, i am done your will. I'm your son now. Deliver me. He says, if there's any other way, nevertheless, your will be done. Because we'll see that very suffering, the very things he went through, that he brought deliverance to the whole planet. And I'm sure it was hard at that point. But he was willing to entrust his life into the hands of the Father. And that's our example. That's our example. Nebuchadnezzar knew God was real. Do you? Do you know God is real? Without a doubt. But he still lived his life at this point for his own plans and for his own purposes. What does it take for us to get to that point where we know God's real to where we're willing to surrender our life? What is it? Do we have to go through the furnace, the fire? Do we have to be broken? I mean, think about what really happened in our lives when we turned it over. If we turned it over. Some of us have, some of us haven't. But just knowing God is real isn't enough. The demons know God is real. And they tremble in his presence because they know they're facing a judgment. And we're all going to stand before God. We're all going to stand before the throne of God and we're either going to be rewarded for the way that we live and what we do or we're going to suffer loss. Even if we know him, even if we claim to give our life to him, we're still going to stand before him and we're either going to face rewards or loss. Paul talks about building with wood, hay and stubble and when it goes through the fire it's burned up and we can be saved by the skin of our teeth and come through smelling like smoke. Nothing to show for what we did here on this earth. Because everything we did was done based out of what we wanted and what we desired and what we thought was important. Instead of getting alone with God and saying, God, what do you want me to do? That's the best way to start off your day. Wake up in the morning, thank you, God, for this new day. What do you want me to do? Well, this is a great example. Do you notice who's missing in this story? Chapter 3. Daniel. Daniel's not here. <laughs> Daniel's not there. You know, I don't think Daniel would have bowed. I don't think he's out there in the group with the 10,000 uh, other Hebrews bowing. I think uh, he's either out of town or the king made sure he wasn't there because the king knew he wouldn't bow to that image. But... Uh, that's speculation. But it is interesting that Daniel is not mentioned in this book, in this chapter. He's not here. But his friends had now enough courage and conviction. See, that's where it really changes. When our beliefs become our convictions, something we're willing to live and die for, that's when it really starts getting real.
And that's what God honors when our convictions become so strong that we actually live by our convictions and not by our circumstances. When everybody else is doing something, that's a lot of pressure. All the leaders, all the cool people, everybody was bowing down and these guys said, nope, this is where we're drawing the line. That takes a lot of conviction. Power of the Holy Ghost takes courage. So we're all going to face this in one way or another. Conform to the image of the world or consequences. My wife would always ask people, you know, getting in school and changing schools, are you able to, you know, share your faith with people? Are you able to, you know, have Bible studies with people? And you know, it's amazing how many people in the schools that I, I never heard one of them just say, oh, yes, from the beginning. You know what most of them say? Oh, no, we're not allowed to do that. Yes, you are. Students in schools are allowed to share your faith, read the Bible, have Bible studies, but they'll tell you you can. And they'll tell you that if you do, you're going to face these consequences. And then you have to choose, are you going to bow or not? Because the truth of the matter is you have the right to do that. And every one of them who, we, who we've talked to who actually did that started seeing God moving. The teachers aren't allowed to in initiate things with, about Christ, but if the students ask a question, the teachers can answer it. Linda actually had one friend who went to her husband. She taught in uh, Henderson State University, and she went to her husband and said, is it okay if I get fired because I start standing up for the Word of God and for Christ in the school? And they prayed about it, and they said, okay. She started sharing about Christ in her class. She put Bibles in her office. And the school started moving in on her. The persecution started turning up and they started moving her from smaller office to smaller office. So finally they moved her to where her office was in a little room with a coffee pot. People would go through her desk, threaten her, but they never, they didn't fire her. And she would do stuff like, she would have uh, like an English comp class. She was an English teacher where everybody's required to take that. And she would like do a presentation, you know, like some people do ballroom dancing, some people do CPR or something. And then you tell people what you're doing and then you'd write on the board and then you'd give your presentation and everybody would fill out this little critique. And so one time she invited us and we did the gospel of Jesus Christ in a state school. We just walked in there, wrote it on the board, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we broke it down as best we could, step by step, what it means what God did, what it means to follow Christ, and asked them, invited them to give their lives to Christ. In a state school, where supposedly you can't do that. And so all these people have to write critiques. This is a mandatory class. Everybody in that, you know, gets a degree, has to take that class. And we had football players and just across the board, all kinds of people. And you know what, they're, we're reading their critiques. They, we, they're stuff like, how come nobody ever told me this before? You believe that in the United States in the 2000s, why have I never heard this before? One person said, I was suicidal. I had given up hope. Now I have hope. Another person was like, this is what Christians are supposed to do, but they just don't do it. And out of 50, the first time we did it, we had 52 classes, 50 of those critiques. One person said, this is preaching and I don't want to hear it. One out of 50. But the rest of them were all positive responses that had an impact on their lives because this one woman was bold enough to risk her job and her position to share Jesus Christ. In a hundred years from now, nobody's going to care who was teacher at that school. But the impact on those people's lives could have been made for eternity. But we're going to have to decide who do we bow to and what image are we going to carry. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this story. Thank you for these brave young Hebrews who are willing to stand for you and give their life for you. God, I pray, Father God, that we would have the guts to stand up for you in our society, Lord, as it presses us to conform to its image, as the pressures turn up as we in, enter the end of the age. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to know in whom we have believed and to trust you, Father God, for the outcome, not to be trying to control you and tell you what we want and what we believe and what we think, God, but yield our lives to you and simply say, God, what do you want us to do? Who do you want us to help? What do you want us to do to make an impact for you and trust you with the outcome? 
I pray for the same kind of strength and character that these three men had in our lives now, that we won't bow to the images of the world, but we'll hold out the image of Christ. And I ask that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.